The Falling Walls Science Breakthrough of the Year 2022 in Art and Science. Breaking the wall to storing data in plants. How DNA can become the data storage medium of the future. Cyrus Clark and Monica Seyfried grow your own cloud. On November 9th, 1989, I was a small child learning to walk and talk with little awareness that great change was coming. On November 9th, 1989, I wasn't alive. However, that day affected my country, my close ones, and my future. Good afternoon, everyone. On the screen, you can see a couple of seats. Today, during our presentation, we'll tell you how those seats, that are also behind us, could become the data storage of the future. Welcome to our presentation about the Grow Your Own Cloud project. We're extremely excited. My name is Monica Seyfried. I'm the interaction designer. And I'm Cyrus Clark. I'm a designer and economist. And we also work with Jeff Navala, who's a synthetic biologist. And the starting point of Grow Your Own Cloud are these two words, data warming, words which don't usually go together. When we began researching data back in 2017, we immediately came across this link between the exponential growth in data storage and associated rise in greenhouse gas emissions that come from that data storage. So we coined this term, data warming, to kind of make this simple for people to engage with and draw attention to this issue. And this issue is very complex. It turns out that the cloud is far less fluffy than we might think. There are already enormous greenhouse gas emissions from the cloud. Something like 4% of our greenhouse gas emissions are related to data storage today. It's also incredibly energy intensive and hungry, putting a strain on scarce energy resources and especially renewable energy that we really need right now. At the same time, this is a trend which is going to get exponentially worse because we have exponential technologies which are great, but that consume a lot more data, things like AI, blockchain protocols, and network technologies like 5G. And what's really interesting, what's really strange about this whole equation is that a lot of this data that we store in the cloud is never used again, and we call that phantom data. That number varies from something like 60 to 80% of the data, but it's enormous. And this equation in general led us to really look for alternatives. So as creatives, we started looking for opportunities, and we came across this amazing oldest storage device in the world, DNA. DNA, as we know, is the language of life, but it's also an excellent information systems language. It's an excellent um, data storage medium. It is very dense. We can store vast amounts of digital data in the liquid drop forms, uh, liquid forms of uh, synthetic DNA. Um, it's also extremely energy efficient, um, and it lasts for long. Um, it's a uh, it's very robust medium. So, I mean, we've just heard a lot about DNA, so we're not going to explain all that again, thankfully. But we're going to try to explain the process. And typically, when we look at DNA data storage technology, you'll see a lot of diagrams like this, which are very hard to read and quite difficult to understand. So we've got, hopefully, a slightly better way. So we're going to start with a very simple story of the image of a dog, which many of you might have. And that image of a dog is a JPEG. But at its core, that JPEG is nothing but zeros and ones. And that's a language. So of course, we can translate those zeros and ones into A's, T's, C's, and G's, which are the language of life. We can then synthesize that DNA to create a liquid drop of data. So literally, we have that JPEG of, of a dog now in liquid form in DNA. So it's in a sequence. So that means that the data is no longer stored on a hard drive. It's actually stored in a new physical form in a liquid drop of DNA. And so it's, it's interesting to see how this technology was kind of evolving at these intersections between the arts and the science. So one of the first people that actually encoded 
Um, a digital file into DNA was Joe Davis. He was an artist. After that, of course, um, scientists are, were and still are looking into these new amazing properties uh, of uh, data storage in DNA. And recently, we saw scientists putting a um, moving image, a GIF, of a galloping horse into a bacteria. And yes, that is possible. We can actually introduce DNA with digital uh, information within it to different organisms. We can think of bacteria, we can think of fungus, but we can also think of other organisms, for example, plants. So that's what we're here to talk about. That was our initial question. What if we could store data in plants? Could we then think about data warming in a slightly different way? Could we store data in a way which absorbs carbon from the atmosphere rather than creating it? Could we store data in a format which actually creates its own energy and self-propagates because it's an organism? And of course, this comes from creatives because scientists may not really ask this kind of question. And because of the work and because of the nature of this research, it's very technical, we went to meet scientists and tried to explore this question with them. And of course, they were completely surprised and shocked and didn't know what to do with the question initially. But step by step, we managed to make some progress. The first step, of course, was understanding DNA data storage, which hopefully you now all understand, that we can synthesize data within a liquid drop, which looks something like this. But the next step of actually engineering plants to contain that data was a complete mystery. And so we had to work with plant geneticists and plant engineers who could understand how to transform and introduce this data to a plant. So we found methods to do that. And then the final piece of the puzzle was, of course, how could you actually retrieve that data from the plant? It's great if it can just go in, but we need an output as well. We need to see the data come back. And that's where we started working with Jeff, who's an expert in DNA sequencing with related to DNA data, te DNA data storage technology, and in particular, a nanopore sequencer, as you see in the last picture on the slide. So we took all of that research and contacted our network and created that piece that likely received the science breakthrough of this year, which is called the Data Garden, the first decentralized data center. So the Data Garden is an interactive artistic installation. And as such, as you might imagine, it's all about data storage in plants. So of course, it features lots of really nice plants which contain data within them. These are things like text files or image files within those plants' DNA. And what we did as part of that work was to take samples from the plants and retrieve the data, providing a liquid sample, as you see here. And then as part of this interactive installation, we wanted to find a way to visualize the data inside of the plants. So we could actually introduce those drops of liquid to a sequencer that we had as part of the installation, and that reads the data. That doesn't happen in real time. That takes a very long time, in fact. But eventually, the data will be represented on the screen after it's decoded, and you'll see a nice image, something like that. And obviously, there's different types of data, so you see different images. And the installation is all about taking care of plants, taking care of nature, and taking care of our data, and understanding the possible impact that this kind of technology could have with regards to carbon absorption and remediation. So we wanted to use the means of art to really show that this type of new biological cloud is actually possible. But most importantly, we wanted to invite others, the visitors, the audience, to actually interact with that cloud, be playful with it, and try to imagine themselves using that in the future. So it's really important framework uh, for us that we're working with, um, this sort of interactive, immersive spaces that are inviting people to try out the new speculative science. But also, most importantly, through this installation, we wanted to show that this cloud could potentially reduce vast amounts of CO2 in the future from the atmosphere. Um, it could be community-owned. Um, it produces its own energy. It works with living organisms, of course. So that can lead to the regeneration of the ecosystems. So that message is really important as part of our work, and it's really important that we wanted to communicate that vision. But what's also really interesting about this kind of collaboration between art and science is that it provokes a host of new questions, both within arts, science, but also ethical questions that the public might want to engage with. 
And the very first question I'm sure all of you have is this. What happens if, like, what happens when my plant dies? Monica, what do you think? What happens when the plant dies? Yeah, it's a very sad situation, first of all. We want to ensure that we take care of our data, and therefore we obviously take care of our plants so that the plant does not die. The plant has this amazing property, uh, properties, right? So, it, first of all, it reproduces itself. Uh, so that is an interesting um, uh, thing when we think about backups, possible backups. But also, if the plant dies, you can still, for quite a long time, retrieve the data and find, find your uh, image within uh, the, the DNA of the plant. So now I have a question to you that probably is on top of many people's minds today. Is, it, is this safe for the um, organism, but also for the ecosystem? As far as we know, yes. So we're working with genetic transformations of the plant that don't affect its characteristic properties. So they don't change the nature of the plant and therefore don't impact on the ecosystem. And we're also working with sequences of DNA which don't encode for anything. So they, go, they don't create anything within the plant itself. So as far as we know within synthetic biology, it is safe in terms of what we're doing right now. And I think in terms of our approach with Grow Your Own Cloud, we've always been very conscious to be asking these ethical questions before we actually do anything. And I think that's really important to stress in our process. And that's why now I think we're a little bit more confident after three or four years of doing this to start exploring how this idea of Grow Your Own Cloud and things like the Data Garden could have some real world applications, whether they're very direct or slightly less direct. And that's why now Grow Your Own Cloud has evolved from being, let's say, an art science project into a biotech organization, which, is, which has its DNA in art. And we're all about developing clean data applications through DNA data storage technology. And I think our role as creatives and designers working with scientists and engineers is to kind of shape that technology in its applications rather than doing fundamental research and to kind of create the storytelling around it and things like the mission of a project like this, which could be around reducing the impact of data storage and working with nature as a technology, which I think are really strong messages that most people could be on board with. This technology can propose different types of futures. One of the visions that we are obviously excited about and want to explore further is how and if it's possible to switch from the server farms to data forests. And that is actually the research we're currently doing in collaboration with the European uh, Commission and thinking of how we can start inviting more data and more nature to the city, what type of um, impact that will have on the urban ecosystem, on the citizens. Um, and this research will be shown next week in the Zetka Museum in Karlsruhe. So we're extremely uh, excited to invite you to, um, to look at it when you're around ZCAM. And yeah, just to say as well, our, our work is very much an invitation to all of you. We know that Falling Walls is an excellent platform filled with really amazing, talented people of all backgrounds, and Grow Your Own Cloud is very much about that. We've been growing a community around this project for the past four years, and we're really now accelerating the growth of that community. So if, you, if anything we've said resonated with you today, please do scan this QR code, which will take you to a myriad of different options to connect with us. That can be something as simple as Instagram or something a bit more involved like Discord. And we'd love to have involvement, your questions. If anyone in the audience would like to work with us, we're very, very open to exploring that with you. And with that invitation, I hope you've had time to scan the QR code by now. So I'll keep stalling for a while until that happens. But that concludes our talk. Delighted again to have been awarded this prize, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much.